My name is Jesse Peterson, and tonight we are talking about the public schools. We have some shocking news for you, so call your friends, call your enemies, and let them know. Tell them to tune in right now. This is going to absolutely blow your mind. Uh, in our public schools, there, are, there is a program called Project 10, and this program is absolutely, in my opinion, out of order, out of order. It does not belong in the public school system. Uh, tonight, my guest is Isola Forster. She is a school teacher at uh, Bell High. Bell High. She's also the author of What's Right for All Americans. And I'd like for you to see this book here. Up to where? Right there. She's the author of that book. She's also the uh, founder of Americans for Family Values. And she's going to tell us tonight about this program, Project 10. So you do want to hear this, all right? So just sit and wait. You're going to be shocked. Isola, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jesse, for having me on. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Also, we have a couple of uh, students from, uh, and a parent from this school as well. My, first, my next guest is Martha Perez. Martha. That's right. All right, thanks for being here. And Freddie Aquino. Oh, that's right. Right, yeah. Freddie? Okay, and Mrs. Perez who is the mother to Martha. Thank you guys for coming on tonight. I appreciate that. Uh, Isola, first tell us a little bit about you, and then we'll get into the school system. Because you, you've been doing uh, a lot of work out there that a lot of people might, may not be aware of. Well, I've been um, employed by the Los Angeles Unified School District for about 32 years now. I started in 1963. And uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, I became politically active. And it stemmed from my filing complaints against the district for uh, misusing funds and mismanaging programs in uh, the public schools. And the, I think it was 1987, our organization, Americans for Family Values, became involved in the education issue by, at that time, fighting the implementation of what they called, they being the State Department of Education guidelines, they called it family guidelines, but it was the teaching of masturbation and homosexuality to our children from kindergarten through 12th grade. So we organized a uh, group from South Central Los Angeles and we went to Sacramento and we joined other uh, family-minded organizations to try to fight it to no avail. It was um, put into the system at that time and it is just now becoming to uh, the focus that it is with the parents taking a look at it as to what's really there. And I really don't believe, uh, Jesse, that a lot of our parents know what really is going on in our public schools. They don't. You know, when I was preparing for the show, I spoke to parents and teachers from Crenshaw High, uh, Manual Arts, um, a couple other high schools. They did not know about the program at all. They had never heard of Project 10. Even some of the uh, instructors at the school was not aware of Project, Project 10. Why is that? How can it be there and they not know about it? Because I believe the vast majority of the teachers and the parents in particular would protest such a program in our public schools. Um, most of this is done underhanded and by the time it becomes 
widespread or the people recognize it is so deeply embedded and our children have been so brainwashed it's hard to get it out once it's in yeah. but um, project 10 was the brainstorm of a lesbian counselor at Fairfax High School in the uh, mid or late 70s uh, her name is Virginia Uribe and uh, what she did she talked about the fact that she was entrusted with the care of a young girl for a weekend competition uh, from the high school and how it became a lesbian affair and from that she decided that 10 percent of our students were homosexual and as such project 10 was born and what they are saying is that the young people who have homosexual tendencies uh, need to be counseled but the fact is the only requirement for being a director of project 10 is to be a homosexual or simple sympathetic to their cause it's not about being psychologically trained which in my opinion that mental health stuff psychiatry and, and psychologists yeah. have ruined our public schools anyway but uh, the fact is this is how it got started and it became popularized in the San Fernando Valley there were a lot of groups there that tried to fight it most notably was Edie Gibb of parents and students together right. and uh, she did a fantastic job but uh, you know, in our public school system now, we have professional parent groups uh, that throw out the will of ordinary parents who really care about what's going on with their students, and so it's very, very hard to fight. Let me ask this. Uh, <clears throat> again, tell us, what is Project 10? Uh, what is it? I say Just for that those that may have missed it, what is it? I really believe Project 10 is nothing more than a, a recruitment club for homosexual students, and it is to expand the homosexual movement. And how do they determine who is homosexual or not in the school? Do they ask the students about it, or uh, are there meetings going on? How would they determine if the child is a homosexual? Uh, teachers are asked to recommend students that might benefit from the program, and <laughs> students are encouraged to um, seek out help in the program, as really? far as I know. And, you know, I, I also discovered that it's in all of the uh, the schools around this area, the LA Unified Oh, not School only District. Project 10, we have what's called a coming out day for teachers in Los Angeles Unified School District, where teachers will stand before their classrooms, kindergarten through 12th grade, and announce that they're homosexual and even bring in their mate to talk about their lifestyle. Some of them even wear t-shirts saying, I'm not gay, but my boyfriend is. And they stand there and they laugh and they talk about their, their lifestyle to encourage the young students to look at it as, as an alternative choice. And what? you know, I may say this, Jesse, a lot of people wonder why so many families are called dysfunctional. Because parents teach morality to their children. Yes. Parents teach their children right from wrong. But on our school campuses, our children are taught there is no right and wrong. So the students look at the parents and wonder, well, what's wrong with them? Oh, it's a generation gap, or they're old, they don't know what we're talking about. Because their teachers and their schools are promoting this immorality. And so the parents are being looked at in a strange way, as yeah. though they're the ones that's immoral. This program, did um, was it voted in by the school board? Uh, I don't understand how it got into the schools without the okay of the parents. That's what well, I again, understand. you have what I call professional parent groups. They're your advisory councils who are paid to be into the schools. Oh, your see. PTA groups now, nothing more than lobby, lobbying groups. They're all political groups, and they are there to rub a stamp whatever the school district and the school okay. board. I mean, they rub elbows with school board members on a daily basis. Whereas your average parent who's trying to raise their children, who are at home looking after their children, who can't be at school every day, who can't be at school board meetings every day, who are not getting paid for this kind of stuff, they're concerned about their children. Their voices are not heard because they do not have an organization behind them. Yeah. And so uh, they're like voices crying out in the wilderness. Do the students that disagree with this uh, program do they go back and tell their parents about it? Uh, uh, 
or do they keep it away from their parents, you know? Well, I'll have to let uh, maybe Martha answer to that okay. as a young student, but I would like to say to you uh, how it be became an explosive issue at our school. Please do, yes. Uh, because I realize that there are some principals who really are of moral and high character, and they don't really push it. But at our particular school, um, we had a discussion in our classroom one day about Project 10. And so the director of Project 10 came into my room and confronted me in front of my students about comments I had made. And I said to him, oh, sure, I said that. In fact, I said a lot more. And I just started telling him everything that I had said, that, yeah. you know, how I felt about the program. And when he walked out of the room, the students applauded and they clapped. And they said, thank you, Mrs. Foss. And I go, what do you mean? I said, well, because in this guy's classroom, and our, we're trying to learn math, and here we are with pictures on his classroom wall of men hugging and women during near hugging and kissing and men and everything. And so we can't concentrate. No. We didn't want to look at all of that. And we've complained and nobody says anything. So I went to the principal <laughs> and I brought the student's complaint to him. And we went round and round, as you well know, Jesse, because yes. I, I want to thank you publicly because um, the teachers union really does not represent teachers who want to do the right thing for students and parents. They really don't. And I would challenge them and I, I, I hope that they see this and I would love to challenge them on that remark. Yes. But the thing is that these students were crying out to somebody to speak up for them. And as you well know, I became the victim yes. speaking out for right. them. I was the one that was, but it was a victory because they, the pictures did come down. Right. And the right. students, and this is how um, these students became involved in it. Because I asked some of the students, and Martha here is so shy and so sweet. She's just <laughs> one of those little students who does her work and doesn't get involved in anything. But she was so happy when she found it because it bothered her too. And, and then when her mother sent the message to me thanking me for what I'd done, I just thought, you know, there are yeah. so many parents that she represents. There are so many students that these young people represent. And I want to say this too, uh, Jesse, this is not to ridicule young people who may have homosexual tendencies. Right. But at that young age, we should be counseling them away from this not lifestyle, not, not into it. Not encouraging, that's right. Uh, what have what have you? I mean, how have you been able to maintain your job as a teacher <laughs> and be so outspoken like this about these kinds of issues? Um, I believe that as long as you're saying what's right, there's strength behind you. And I thank you for being one of the strengths behind me, you and the Bond organization. Yeah. I think that that is so very important. And as I say to, to, to ordinary parents, you do need organizations behind yeah. you. But we, we need organizations who really are doing what's right for our people, not just promoting policies for the bureaucracy. Let me ask you this, and then we'll get to uh, the rest of our guests. Uh, the black politicians like Maxine Waters and, and Jesse Jackson and others, what are they doing about Project 10? Are they aware of it? Are they trying to get rid of it or encourage it? Do you know? How do they feel Well, about you it? know, uh, we have Willie Brown to thank with his Consenting Adult Act for uh, promoting the homosexual mm -hmm. movement and giving them the power that they have. His 1976 legislation opened up the door for the homosexual movement, and that's why they have moved so blatantly yeah. and so boldly into every institution destroying family as we know it. Um, and then you have uh, Maxine Waters, who actually brought the sex clinics into our our public schools uh, for you know uh, Watts Jordan High School is one of the uh, ones with the uh, I think there were two other in the school district that brought in the sex clinics uh, which promote uh, abortions without parental consent and uh, all of these things that's really destructive to the parents and they too well you know I mean Maxine was a uh, one of the 
uh, not the Grand Marshal, but she rode in the Gay Pride Parade, the last one they had. So that tells you where, where our politicians stand. And here you had in 1987, when the Supreme Court was hearing the Georgia sodomy law, you had uh, Jesse Jackson standing on the steps of the United States Supreme Court with 500 leaders from the homosexual community demanding the right to sodomize each other. And sodomy is the number one cause of AIDS in America. <laughs> so that tells you where our leadership is. The Reverend Jesse Jackson, don't forget the Reverend. This is a, a <laughs> preacher, remind you. Yes. Amazing. And sadly enough, none of our moral leaders challenge him. Not yeah. one are out there really challenging him. Yeah. So that means that he, he speaks for black Christians in America, and I think that's a sad commentary. They're all cowards, that's what it is. Uh, Martha, what grade are you? Ninth. 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 And how did you find out about Project 10? Well, I didn't know about Project 10, but what really bothered me was all the posters on the wall. Yeah. And uh, how do your other friends feel about it? And they feel the same way or worse. They do. Really? And what kind of posters did you see? Um, men half naked and kissing, <laughs> hugging, women doing the same thing. That's amazing. Ninth grade. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> Well, you see, Jesse, the thing is, you have within our teachers' union a gay and lesbian commission. You have on the school board a gay and lesbian committee. So uh, uh, they're all in. They're everywhere. I mean, how can, <coughs> what can these parents do? But how did they get in there, though? That's what, were we asleep when this was happening, or how did they get on these commissions? Under the Why Civil Rights Banner. Under the Civil Rights Banner, they uh, cried that their civil rights were being uh, violated. And so, as a result, uh, a lot of people, a lot of well-meaning, decent, decent people, uh, decided to look at it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the fact is, it's not that America has not been tolerant of the lifestyle. America has not been accepting of yeah. the lifestyle and that's the difference. And so what the homosexual movement is all about is making it an acceptable <coughs> thing and making it no different from anything else. And I think that all of us should realize, uh, you know, we have a wide spectrum of society that has had homosexual experiences. So we don't want to, to just put a general brush over yeah. all of them as being radical homosexuals because you have had some uh, people who are heterosexual oriented but through particular circumstances, prison, uh, adolescent experimentation, abuse or what have you, yeah. have had a, a, a homosexual experience. Uh, so, uh, but then, and then you have those who are not interested sexually in the opposite sex and not even in the same sex, they just <laughs> not interested. But then you have the radical ones who will, through promiscuous active actions, will promote it and will make it a part of everyday And those life. are the ones that seem to get away with it too. They seem to get what they want by being radical and loud and pushy. It seems as though America is so weak now, they don't really fight against these people in a manner that they should. Well, they're very powerful, and they're getting our tax dollars. Yeah. They've got all kind of grants and nonprofit organizations, <laughs> and they get the, our own tax dollars to force this upon our children. So we pay for that. We pay for it. Oh, absolutely. Oh We're going to take a break, and when I come back, I'm going to talk to Martha about uh, some other things. So you can be nervous for a little while longer. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. Bond, the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. Rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. For more information, call us toll-free, 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-BOND. Welcome back to the program. We are talking about Project 10, a homosexual program in our public schools. And uh, it just, it's terrible to hear the things that we were hearing about it. If you missed even the first segment of this program, just call the studio and uh, they will replay it for you. Uh, Martha, what do you think about homosexuality uh, overall? What are your opinion of that? Well, I'm not against it, but I really don't like it in my education. Yeah. Um, now that the program is there and you are aware of the program, how are the homosexual kids acting toward other kids and about the program. 
Is it like are they flaunting this now, or are they trying to are they embarrassed by being homosexual, or is it out in the open? No, it's out in the open. <laughs> it's out in the open. Uh, can you give me some example of what you see these kids doing on campus that uh, let you know that it's out in the open? Well, when you go to the restroom during lunch, there's girls kissing or in the bench, they're hugging and. Really, they kissing in the restroom? Mm-hmm. Oh my God, we need a straight bathroom, right? A bathroom for the straight girls. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to see done about this? If, if you could do something about it to change it, what would you like to do? Mm, well, don't have Project 10. Yeah. Are you going to work on getting it out? Can it be taken out, you know? Well, it, it can be taken out, but it would be a massive effort on the part of the parents. Yeah. Uh, and it would take a lot of publicity because uh, just going to the school board to speak um, is not enough. And as I said, there's so many, um, so much organized opposition that it would have to be made um, something that a media event in which the parents would just have to do demand. It sounds like it would be a out. good fight, though. It sounds like something it worth would, fighting you know, for. It, it would be a good fight. Now, yeah. I would say this to you, though, uh, Jesse. I We're at a point now where we're saying, okay, we have to accept all of these things. But my complaint is, let's give the opposing viewpoint to the kids. Yeah. I have some great referrals for these kids uh, to help them to get out of this lifestyle. And they don't give statistics, you know, because uh, there's all kind of statistics out there to show that homosexuals, by the nature of what they do, suffer more illnesses. Yeah. And 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 that is the the, the impact on society. When you look at hepatitis B and and, and the, uh, the all of these other illnesses AIDS. that oh well AIDS even before AIDS though, and and so uh, but. The these are the things that's not told to our children. The psychological, the biological effect. The, I mean, it's just so much to be told to them. But if they're going to go into a classroom to have meetings and just see pictures that, that are erotic and enticing, how will they ever yeah. denounce this kind of thing? Amazing. Did you tell your mom, your parents about that as soon as you discovered that? Yes, I told her about every post in class and she told me to go to the principal, but I told Miss Foster, and she said that um, nothing could be done. Really? Yeah, but um, thanks to her, they put them down. All right. <laughs> Mrs. Perez, what was your, uh, what did you think when you heard about this uh, program? ¿Qué pensó usted cuando, cuando Marta le dijo de esas fotos? Se imagina, pues, no sé, me dio mucho, me sorprendí de primero porque, pues, Es oh, un salón de clases, ¿verdad? Para que ella me venga a decir, no es ni salón de... It's a math class. It's no es salón de que enseñen algo del cuerpo, nada de it's eso. It's not a room for the show. Es salón de matemáticas. Yeah. This particular class is a history class, right? Is it math, math class. Math class. Yeah, yeah I, I, I went there. Isola told me about it. I went to the class to see it for myself. And I was just shocked to see in a math class on the bulletin board all these homosexual pictures and men hugging men and, and stuff like that. It didn't relate to the class at all. Actually, well, uh, Jesse, the worst ones had come down before <laughs> you got there. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Perez, are uh, other parents aware of this? And did you tell them about it after you found out about it? And if so, would they like to do something about it? ¿Usted piensa que otros padres quisieran hacer algo de esto? Pues, yo pienso que sí. Well, she thinks, yeah. Y he estado hablando así con padres que tienen hijos ya en la escuela y She's que van a ir a la escuela. Y, have students in the school, y dicen, room. nos decían que estaba mal, ¿verdad? Our own parents said that it was bad. They said it was bad. Do they feel helpless in the situation as though they can't do anything about it? Ellos se sienten sin, como sin ayuda. Sin poder hacer nada? No, ahora ya no, porque gracias a la maestra aquí presente. Well, not, not now. Um, thanks to Miss Foster. Good. Se logró el propósito que well, quitaran todas las, las fotos que tenían ahí en la pared. Thanks to Miss Foster, they took all those pictures. Are they going to put them back or just because come June, they're going to have homosexual or well this month right. in the schools? Will they put them back at that time, or 
Is this like a temporary taking down thing or what? I'm not really sure, um, uh, Jesse, how they're going to do this. Uh, we have a school board member, uh, Jeff Harton, who, um, after being elected to the school board, announced his homosexuality. And then he and his lover <laughs> were pictured on the front page of the Metro section of the Los Angeles Times. And um, with him being on the board, and with Jackie Goldberg, city council person who has that avowed uh, a lesbian, um, you know, it's going to take the public to demand changes because these legislatures are not going to yeah. do it. Uh, and you have, as I said earlier, uh, professional parent groups so that when parents complain, like Ms. Perez or anyone else who might call the school, they are then directed to the parent office. Parents have an office on campus. And so that's so the parent can handle it. And as you know, I mean, it took us almost um, well over a month to yeah. fight to get these pictures down. And, and, and it's the thing is, I think it was when I, <laughs> when I threatened to put up a picture of Jesus Christ that they decided, well, we better not <laughs> uh, you know, get too crazy. <laughs> but if you're going to put up pictures and you say that this could go up, and I, I said, well, perhaps our heterosexual men will put up Playgirl centerfolds. I mean, when, yeah, when are yeah. we going to come up with standards? When, right. We've got to decide one way or the other that uh, we've got to have some decency in our classrooms. Martha, the girls that you see kissing in the bathrooms and in the hallways or wherever, they don't feel embarrassed about it when you when you see them doing it? Does it seem to be pretty normal to them? Yeah. As though it's just okay? Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, the kids that are heterosexual, do they ever say anything to them about it or just to themselves and go along with it? Mm, well, they talk to their friends and they just Get in, get in a little group and lunch? <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. Uh, we're coming to the end of the program. We will be doing a uh, part two series on this. Uh, Isola, what can the people do, the, the parents? What can be done about this? I think they need to uh, flood the school board offices and they need to contact their state legislature uh, also to remove these kind because as I said earlier, it is in the guidelines from our state department of education. So it's come all the way from the top. It's going to be very hard to fight it when, when the people from the very top are the ones there. But I think we need to, uh, to get together, Jesse. Maybe you and I and our organizations can <laughs> see what we can do to uh, get the you, parents contacted. You have a nonprofit organization. Yes. Is there a phone number that we can reach you at? Yes, it's area code 310-823-5871. One more time. 310-823-5871. I appreciate you guys coming on. Thanks a lot. Okay, welcome to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson, and we're doing a two-part series on Project 10 in the Los Angeles Unified School District. You're going to be shocked. It's a homosexual program, and it is it's totally out of control, out of order. Uh, Isola Forster is here. She uh, stayed over last night, so if she had on the same thing from last night, <laughs> she stayed overnight. She's Isola Forster is a school teacher at Bell High School. She's also the founder of Americans for Family Values, and she's the writer of this book, What's Right for All Americans. And uh, I tell you, it's just shocking the things that she's telling me about Project 10. Uh, if you did, if you happen to have missed last week, just call the studio and they will replay last week's show because we can't repeat a lot of the things that we talked about last week. Uh, Isola, just real quickly, just bring it for the new, uh, the people just tuning in for the first time, tell them again about Project 10. Uh, Project 10 is listed as a counseling <laughs> organization for homosexual students within the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, I call it more appropriately what it is, oh, wow. is a recruitment of uh, students into the homosexual movement. Yes. How, how old is this program? How long has it been in the public school system? I believe it um, was first implemented in the late 70s, and I'm not really sure how late in the 70s. No. Um, but it started out very quietly, 
at, in the, I think the first school to receive it, well it originated at Fairfax High School with a uh, counselor by the name of Virginia Uribe uh, who declared herself to be a homosexual, I'm sorry, a lesbian teacher, not that there's much difference. <laughs> What's uh, the difference lesbian between a lesbian, aren't they the same? And a homosexual, they do the I, same thing. I think so, but you know, um, I have found in a lot of my debates with um, leaders from the homosexual community, they do not like to be called homosexual. They really don't. They, if you don't call them gay, it's like you're insulting them. They <laughs> do not like the word homosexual. Well, you know what's happening in our society today? Words that are penetrating, the, wor the words that are true, uh, we are kind of softening those words down now. Like with sin, we don't call sin sin anymore. We call it something else. We don't call it as it is because people don't like the truth and the truth hurts. So that's probably one of the reasons that they want to take out the word homosexuals and call it gay because gay seem a little more happier. Right. <laughs> 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 yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> It's all just so that they don't think that you hate homosexuals. How do you feel about homosexuals? Well, you know, it's actually I'm so glad you asked me that, <laughs> uh, Jesse, because um, I was one of those in the '60s who really jumped on the freedom train, yes. and so I just embraced whatever free speech movement said I was supposed to, <laughs> flowers, everything, right? And, uh, but there was a teacher at uh, another school before I went to Bell uh, that did drama at the school and I was very much involved in school activities and so we became very good friends and he, um, it turned out, was a homosexual. Now, he, at the time that we met, which was like 68, 69, um, it was not the thing to do to announce your homosexuality, right. especially as a teacher. But as I said, after the um, a study, uh, what is it, Consenting Adult Act that Willie Brown passed in 76, it was like the floodgates just flew wide open. And so I think I felt like most other people that, okay, whatever you want to do, as long as you do it in private, that's your business, you know. But I found that, in fact, um, my experience with him and those that I met through him um, actually did find themselves attracted to young boys yeah. and young students and did entice them to, uh, to come to their homes and so forth. Really? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, in fact, I was so friendly with this guy. We, um, I, and and I, it sounds like a, one of those old cliches, but he really was one of my best friends. We went to each other's <laughs> families events, uh, uh, weddings, birthdays, and so I even went to a gay bar with him. <laughs> so people can't say I'm homophobic. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. uh, and, and I realized that you can't just, if, if, if you don't keep sex private, all sex private, then I think you're doing a disservice yes, to our young people. That's right. Especially our young people. I mean, we as adults, we, we can excel or take this with a grain of salt, but the young minds are so impressionable. I know that to many of our young students today, if you think that there's something wrong with homosexuality, then they say it's something wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, and That's that true. you are not uh, tolerant enough, or they'll they'll say to me, well, you know, do you hate it, hate them? Well, I don't, and I can't e explain to them how what what the difference is. The kids are being brainwashed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and they work on the minds of the kids all the time, mm -hmm. you know, day in and day out. So after, and kids are very, it's very easy to convince them of anything. You after know, on the last show, uh, Jesse, you had asked Martha. Uh, had she seen other young people or what evidence of the um, and how the girls are kissing in the restroom? Yes. Well, students had told me about that too, but more than that, you know how senior class has the class favorites? Yes. The number one couple in the senior favorites were two girls. Oh my goodness. And so, <laughs> so this is what I'm saying. Oh it's God. just so hard. And there are some teachers that encourage this kind of thing actually encourage this kind of thing. Oh my God. So it's, it's really, uh, it's quite a battle we have there. I want to ask, and I'll take you a question, I want to ask Mrs. Perez, um, have you gone to the principal about this at all? Are you the principal of this? No. Why not? 
Porque primero ella... Sí. Le, le aconsejé que ella hablara primero. Sí, sí, tell her daughter to, to tell the principal or Miss Foster. Uh -huh. um, are you, um, I believe that it would be more powerful, it would be better if you were to go to the principal because uh, a lot of time when the parents don't get involved, they won't take it as serious. And I think that what the parents need to do is get together, organize, and go to the principal about this issue. Dice que sería mejor que el, el par, teniendo un padre eh, protestando sería mejor para, para el proyecto de usted se acabe pues sí 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 creo que sí sería mejor y estamos dispuestas a she, hacer lo que sea con she said it's sea. better she, they're all like they're all gonna gather up and go yeah they si are si quieren reunir todos podrían ir sí claro que yeah. sí okay and if you need some help you definitely have my help and the whole organization behind you. So. Le ayuda. Okay. And Thank you know you already have Miss Fortune, so that won't yes, be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, oh, okay. You had a question here. Wow, I'm I'm flat. I'm just blown away by what I'm hearing. This this is incredible. None of this stuff was ever going on when I was when I was uh, growing up in the high schools. I mean, we had our we it, the dope problem because I was way out in a public school in uh, Arizona. The dope problem was just starting, and uh, I can see that as uh, heterosexual men become more perverted, they allow the perversion on the other side to to grow and to you know. Well, I'm a pervert. What am I going to say to them? You know, kind of thing. And and I believe that's a big reason why all this is uh, blowing up in our face because we're not taking care of our own uh, morality at home. You know, it's we can't. How can we point a finger at their perversion when we ourselves are so perverted in in what we're doing? You know, as as heterosexual men and and women. And, you know, like you said, the Playboy Centerfold, and we're all lost in sex ourselves. And when these guys are coming out from the, from the very radical, you know, sexual deviance, you know, it's, it's just another step downward. And uh, we're not, that's a big reason why we're not standing strong. And uh, I was just wondering if, you know, when you were saying about all this stuff that's going on, the people that are responsible, I feel that we should, like, with Willie Brown and the people who are in charge of all this, who's passed these laws to make it, we should just like punch them as hard as we can in the face and drown them in the ocean. I think that's a, <laughs> that's a perfect, you know, because the good book says that if, if, someone, if someone like this tries to destroy our kids, they should have a, what is it, something tied around their neck and it better for them if they had it, something tied around their neck and thrown in the ocean. And that, that urge to, to do that came into me and I, I know now where that guy got that scripture from. When he was thinking about these, the way these people promote, because it's different from the homosexuals who are caught into what they're doing, and really, you know, don't don't really realize what they're doing, and the radical ones who do know the sickness and and how bad it is. They've seen both sides. They they do know what they're doing, and they're doing this to destroy America for their own power purposes or whatever their their motive is. And well, uh, we've recently seen where uh, Willie Brown, after becoming the uh, mayor of uh, San Francisco, held a mass wedding with uh, homosexuals. Now, we have a, um, a bill that um, our California Assembly will be voting on if they haven't already done so. I, I think they were planning to vote on it around the, the 9th or the 8th, but we should uh, all call our uh, representatives because this is AB 1982, which uh, would block California recognizing homosexual marriages. Now, what has happened in the state of Hawaii, uh, the Supreme Court there is hearing the case on whether or not homosexual marriages will be recognized by Hawaii. Well, there's a part in our Constitution where if the state of Hawaii recognized that, all states could also recognize that. So what we're doing, uh, we have a bill that's pending now that even if Hawaii recognizes it, California would not. And uh, this is what we need to do. We need to contact our uh, representatives in the State Assembly as well as the Senate because it will be going to the Senate and let them know that we support 1982 and that we do not want uh, recognition of homosexual marriages. Um, we have to start by attacking those laws yeah. uh, that's being made because it's like the principal at our school 
even if he were a, uh, a righteous Christian person, if his school board that's over him and the superintendent that's over him and the legislature that's over him and all of them approve it, um, what does he care about little people like us? So uh, that's what we have to do. We have to keep up with these laws because uh, they're being passed every day. And you know, we're always told that you can't legislate morality, but all the while, immorality is being legislated. Yeah. And this is what we need to keep our eyes open for. And I think that would be better than tying a rope around the neck and punching them in the belly <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and pushing them in the ocean. Hi, I was wondering, uh, do you ever speak to black people who feel like uh, homosexuality's plight is the same as blacks' plight, and how do you, what do you tell them, and how do you make, are you able to help them see that there is a difference? Uh, actually, I have not spoken to groups per se, but when I do uh, radio or television call-in shows, uh, and that subject comes up, I do have some blacks who do equate the homosexual movement with the civil rights movement. And I say to them that uh, despite what the leaders of the homosexual community say, there is no scientific or any other evidence to indicate that people are born homosexual. But you are born with your skin color. And, and that there's no equation between how or what you have sex with as, com as opposed to what race you are. Like you people are saying they remember they've always been homosexual, but I don't understand how people don't remember what happened when they were two years old, four years old, five years old. So a lot of things happen to people that, that, that they don't remember. And so they may not have been homosexual at that time before that. So I don't see where it has anything to do with your genetic makeup either. Most of your renowned psychiatrists uh, dispute the fact that uh, homosexuals are born, that it is a learned behavior. There's a lot of pressure on psychiatrists to say that it's okay though now. Oh, well listen, thanks to our psychiatrists and our psychologists, that's why homosexual is so acceptable now. And I say all the time that any psychiatrist that says there's nothing wrong with homosexuality should have his head examined. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> He's probably a homosexual himself or herself. Uh, Martha, what do you want to do about this? Mm, about what? About this thing, this project 10. Do you want to get it out? Um, certainly. Okay, you want us to organize and fight it? Yeah. Yeah, it, it has to start somewhere. And I think Bell High School is a good place to start. I think that you have a lot of nerve, though. Ninth grade, that takes a lot of courage to do that. I admire that. That's Thank good. You. Um, do you, uh, um, have you ever had any homosexual friends or lesbian friends, mm -hmm. whatever you call them? No, Yourself? not really. Not really? No, I'm not, uh, I'm not interested. No. <laughs> <laughs> good. Keep it that way. Um, how, have you ever guys have had open discussion about homosexuality in any of your classes or anything like that? No, not really. You just entered junior high school, though, so, I mean high school, so you haven't been there that long yet. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, John, you have a, you should have a question. Well, what I, what I would like to, yeah. What I would like to mention is that uh, what uh, uh, parents or people in overall are facing is that we are, uh, uh, there's too much apathy. You see, we are facing an organized uh, drive from the part of the homosexual community to really promote their way of life, to bring it into a school. You know, I don't understand. A school is an is a, is a institution of learning. What does the, why should the school be utilized to promote uh, a lifestyle, to promote homosexuality? I mean, it's there to learn. It's, it, it's an institution of learning. And that the problem is, what I mentioned before, is also that how many parents do really know about it? See, uh, if there is anything to be done about it, and, and I don't know, you know, because I'm just posing the question. Uh, if there is anything done about it, I think uh, the parents should be rallied. The parents need to know what's going on in the schools and, uh, you know, stand up against it. I think that would be one way to... Uh, to do something about it, to, to really make it public knowledge what uh, the homosexual, homosexual community is trying to promote, to bring it out into the open so that everyone knows. I, I don't know if that's, is that a valid uh, situation today? Well, uh, my experience has been that most families have found out about it through happenstance. 
Uh, there have been parents who have gone to the school, maybe had for some reason or the other had to go to the health office, maybe to pick up a child or what have you, and they'll notice the posters. And then they'll call us and ask us, well, what about this? But in terms of there being a lot of publicity about it, um, I don't know that there is. I think that many schools are really embarrassed about it. And I believe that a lot of them really try not to promote it. Uh, but there are schools where you do have the activists on campus and they do flaunt it and do promote it. And I believe that this is what happened at our school, that this person was actually an activist. Um, there would be no other reason to plaster your classroom walls in a math classroom with these type of things. Um, so, uh, but as far as parents actually knowing, um, when there's an outbreak of chicken pox at the school, every parent get a letter. When there's an outbreak or, or there's a new program that the school want them to know about, testing and so forth, every parent get a letter. But on this, it may or may not be casually mentioned, maybe in a newsletter that's published. I haven't seen it yet published in a newsletter. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back in a moment. Bond, the brotherhood organization of a new destiny. Rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. For more information, call us toll-free, 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-BOND. Okay, welcome back to the program. We were talking about Project 10, a homosexual program in our public schools. And uh, there's really something else to hear about this. Isola Forster is a school teacher at... Bell High School, and she's also the founder of Americans for Family Values and the writer of this book, What's Right for All Americans. Isola, your, uh, your organization is a nonprofit organization. How, tell us a little bit about Americans for Family Values and how people can get in contact with you. All right, we um, got our start uh, in the early, I should say the late 70s, and it was for fighting an illegal attendance policy at our school that caused our students to fail. And so some of the parents and um, other teachers and community members got together to fight that policy. Um, and we ended up filing a complaint all the way up to the State Department, United States Department of Education, uh, finding that this district really had violated Title I and the uh, other programs designed to improve the education of our minority children especially. And then after that I uh, became involved in the political arena. I had been a, an activist in the Democrat Party for 17 years mm. and when I switch, found out that my fellow Democrats were the ones selling our children down the river, I decided, well, I'll switch parties and see what goes on here. <laughs> and uh, I've been active in the uh, Democrat Party for 17 years. Right now, I'm not active, uh, a real activist in either party, even though I speak a lot at Republican gatherings and so forth. But I find out that um, we need a stronger emphasis on the family. We make the family an issue come political times, and we talk about uh, legislation like uh, days off from work for having babies. That's not family mm. values that we're talking about. Um, so we came together and decided that we would fight for morality and public policy, that we would try to maintain traditional family values. And this is how we organized. Uh, and we've been together. There's, um, we're not a membership organization. We have volunteers that help us uh, when we need to demonstrate or when we need to write letters or when we need to accomplish a goal that's mutually beneficial uh, or that just benefits the community or the people in general. And how can people reach you? Is there a phone number or uh, yes. that they can write? Our telephone number is 310-823-5871. That's 310-823-5871. Anything that you need to know about America for Family Values, Isola Foster, just call that number, and uh, she can help you on that. Isola, I noticed the school board members of the school board and the uh, parent, uh, the PTA, are they voting in now, the PTA? Uh, how, how do they choose parents to be a part of the PTA? If a parent, like uh, Mrs. Perez, can she become a part of that? 
Uh, yes, she can. And how can she go about doing that? Well, actually, the PTA send membership forms home every year uh, by their students. Uh, home to the parents okay. for that. There's also a parent advisory councils. Now, following the uh, 1965 uh, Watts riots, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was passed, and the idea was to bring more minority parents into the community. And so this is where your advisory councils came about. And then uh, it was discovered that parents were actually paid to be in that program. Um, so, PTA, Advisory Council, they're so all kind it, it's of It's just a matter of filling out a form. <laughs> it's just a matter of filling out a form. But, but you see, the thing is that parents uh, like Mrs. Perez and, and, and parents who really care, they really need to get together with like-minded parents yeah. because the leaders in the PTA, it's, it's almost like fighting another bureaucracy. And, and I realize that, but it seems as though if they began to get in there, parents who are against all this stuff, that is a beginning because oh, of, you know, after a while they can kind of make decisions as well. Mm -hmm. are you, Mrs. Perez, are you familiar with the uh, PTA? Hmm. No. 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 Uh, so parents don't go to PTA meetings and things like that. Uh, do you ever get notice? Oh, I guess not if you're not That's familiar with it. That's a good question. I was, I was hoping you would ask yeah. her that. Has she gotten do, any information? Have you ever gotten any notice or anything school? about no, PTA no. meetings? No. Nothing. No. Uh, uh, Martha, uh, your teachers don't give you any notice about the uh, upcoming PTA meetings for the parents? Mm -hmm. No. No. Are you familiar with the PTA? I've heard about it. You heard about it, but you don't really know what it's all about? No. Really? Wow. It's a well-kept secret on a lot of campuses. <laughs> <laughs> so if the kids are not getting the notice about it, so uh, people like Mrs. Perez can never be a part of it. Well, the, she never sco receive any the schools have a parent newsletter that is mailed out. They have what's called a cluster office that sends another parent newsletter out. Uh, so they do send newsletters out, but new, these are newsletters on the wonderful things that are happening at the school. Yeah. It does not include controversial issues. And if parents have a problem at the school on simple matters, uh, just dress codes or immoral acts like this and so forth, those kind of things are not included in newsletters and when they try to address those kind of issues that's when uh, they are sent from one office to the other yeah. on a wild goose chase. Principals no, no longer have power in the schools. I was surprised to discover that. I remember when I was growing up the principal was the man, you know, whatever. He had authority in schools but now he doesn't have any authority. Um, he like most companies are being encouraged to do, the school is being run by committee. So you have a committee here and a committee there that has to decide. So the buck never stops any place. Wow. It continues to flow out there. <laughs> That's amazing. And our tax dollars are paying for this. Oh, yeah. That's, that really blows my mind. Uh, it's all, we're coming to the end of this program again. Uh, a couple of things I really want to make clear to the parents. What can they do about it? Uh, where should they begin to do something? I mean, what is the first step to deal with this issue? Now, for those parents that don't agree with it. Okay, the, the first step is to find like-minded parents whose, whose children are having the same problems and to get together. If it only takes one, then that one will do it. Yes. But if they can get together and go in and first start with the principal, and then if they don't get any... Um, headway there, then they can move on and, and go on up a little bit higher. But their best bet is to get an organized group behind them that could bring this to the attention of the media because the one thing this district does not want is to be exposed for its wrongdoings. Yes. Again, your phone number for America for Fam Family Values? 310-823-5871. Okay. Uh, we're out of time again. Uh, I think that we're doing a part three series on this. And when I come back, I want to talk to them about the fathers. Uh, are they involved with the kids at school? And how much does that have to do with what's happening in our public schools? I'll see you next Monday night.
Welcome to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson. Uh, I don't know if you saw the last two segments, but Isola Foster is still here. Uh, she has on the same thing because she cannot afford to buy anything else. She is a black conservative. <laughs> and when you're black and a conservative, you don't have money. All right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true in this case. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you staying over, Isola. Thank you. I, I decided that in this particular segment, I just want to talk about uh, uh, the situation in the black community, uh, the mindset uh, of uh, black people. You've been around for a long time, and uh, I've read about you. I've seen a lot of your videotapes. I've heard you on different programs like CNN and C-SPAN and just all over. And just hearing about your history, it's been tough for you, but yet you've seen to... Uh, Manage, you know, you still look good. You're hanging in there, and I appreciate that and I admire that. Thank you. Um, um, tell me about the mindset of uh, not all, but most black people. They seem to be stuck into a mindset. Uh, they seem to be influenced by the wrong people, the wrong kinds of people. You know, the ministers and politicians and things like that. What is what is what is wrong with the mindset of black people? I think it all came about um, during the black movement of the 60s. And um, I think that the idea that we had to have um, a black leader, period. You know, we've had in the past distinguished people whose writings would influence our thinking. Um, we would sometimes uh, hear people at lectures and so forth. But a different thing happened in the 60s. It was like a leader that said, this is what you must do, this is how you must think, and this is what you have to be in order to be black. Right. And um, it, it's a sad thing, but I think this is where we are today. Um, why do we fall for it? You know, I grew up on a plantation in Alabama. Uh, my grandparents and my parents used to work this plantation. I never heard them really complain about it. You know, I, I didn't hear them uh, being angry at the white man or trying to cause us to hate the white people. And as a result of that, my uncles and cousins would finish high school. They would go off to college and they would come back and become school teachers and, and participate in the community. But, and, and you're right, during the 60s, something else happened that took us away from the black universities and from working and earning our own way. Um, um, I don't know, I, I still don't quite know what changed the mind though, is it? Because Dr. King, when I read about Dr. King, what is happening today was not his idea. He talked about forgiveness, uh, being free and character building, and he understood that if we forgave, if we worked hard, we would develop that character. Uh, did Jesse Jackson and the other twist that idea or did they pervert it in some kind of way that caused the black people to begin to think in a different way? Well, I think so. Uh, the, if you look at the history of the movement, the very first thing that was done was to change our name. And that was to, in, in order to do that, it was to tell the people that the name Negro was given to them by whites and so you have to reject that name oh. and become black. Um, and that the whole idea of blaming the white person for our name, for our lives, for our, our living conditions, for everything about us began to set in. Yeah. And I think that was one of the problems. But like you, uh, Jesse, I can remember I went where I was born it was such a small town and not to give my age away but it was in the late 30s at a time when not too many people um, accepted the idea of blacks being free right. so the men in the community really had to be strong and yeah. they were and like you even though segregation and bias and racism was at the hilt at the time it was the way we dealt with it. Yes. I know when we worshiped at the Catholic Church, there was only one church in town. It was the Catholic Church. And all of the blacks had to, uh, of course, sit in the back. Uh, we couldn't take communion until all the whites did first. So the blacks started complaining. Well, my grandfather, 
would say to the people, why complain? Yeah. Let's get our own church. That's right. And I don't know if my grandparents got their 40 acres in a mule, but they owned quite a bit of the town where I was born. And so he donated the, la the land. The men got together and built the church themselves. Yes, that's right. And, and then uh, we had only one market. We used to call it the big store in the town. And again, everybody got waited on. I don't care how long we stood there with our little groceries. And then the men got together in the town and built a little grocery store and before you know it everybody in town was coming to our grocery store yep. because it was not only quality but you got served quicker because you didn't have to sell everything else that the big store was selling so we looked at it as a challenge as competition and we moved on and yep. we bettered our lives I can remember in the 40s and 50s in black communities we had thriving commercial strips yeah. we could go um, shopping for clothes for groceries hardware store go watch a movie go sit in a jazz club without ever leaving our community you know I was talking to the director of my uh, big brother program and he reminded me that when we were growing up, he was in Louisiana and I was in Alabama, but they had for white only water fountains. Mm -hmm. And even that didn't seem to bother me. You know, I, I didn't, I knew, <laughs> I guess I, I don't even remember thinking much about it. I noticed it, but it didn't matter, you know. Yeah. It, it was, it didn't matter. I know? can remember in high school, uh, we would go downtown and they had the white only in the color drinking fountains and we would drink out of the white fountain and the cell clerks would look at us and they go you know better you used to have to drink that colored fountain we said but we don't want colored water otherwise we drink kool-aid <laughs> you know and they look at us real strange and we look at them and but they didn't call us ugly names yeah. they would just shake their heads and say those little sassy children because we were. We were challenging at that time. And I think that, again, my father used to drive us from Texas to Louisiana to visit grandparents all the way there. We could not go in to use the restroom. We could buy gas at the service station. We couldn't go in. And like you said, my father and my mom never once ridiculed right. whites. We never heard anything negative. Yeah. And even though we didn't understand and we questioned it, they never explained it to us in terms of blaming somebody that's else. Right. You know, I think that's the problem today, too. Uh, the hatred that many blacks are holding mm -hmm. in their hearts is what's holding them back in life. And I think that that's why people like Jesse Jackson and Maxine Waters and others can manipulate and control the minds of the people because they keep that hatred going. You know, they keep oh, them absolutely. hateful. And when mm -hmm. you hate in your heart, you can't see your way clear. In, in the earlier days, we knew the situation, I mean, the laws were against black, we couldn't move about, but we didn't hate, and because we didn't hate, we were still able to function. We had our own university, we had families, mm -hmm. and things were better, and I think that if we, if we had not crossed over into the hatred, we would be better off today, because we do have more opportunity, and yet blacks are complaining and, and murmuring. And well, a lot of blacks are feeling that um, without the movement of the 60s, blacks would not have advanced. Uh, without affirmative action, we would not be in colleges. And I can remember in 55, when, when I finished high school, um, my girlfriend was accepted at UCLA. Well, she had all grades. Mm -hmm. uh, I struggled through. I may have been a C <laughs> average or B. But I knew with my grades, there was no way I could get there, yeah. even if I had the money. But and, and we read about blacks being at Harvard and all these big universities way back when. That's right. Um, blacks think that we couldn't vote before the 60s. And my gosh, I remember my parents having gone through poll tax and literacy tests to vote for Roosevelt and Truman, all these years of voting, and to see young people really believe that we just didn't have these privileges before, yeah. that we, we have to take to the streets to get them. Let's talk about Maxine Waters and, and, and the politicians that you have gone up against. Uh, <laughs> what is it what do you see about them that the rest of the American blacks, not all, because many blacks are waking up to these people now, what do you see about them that they don't see, that you would like for them to understand, that can cause them to become free? 
Well, first of all, I think that uh, all of us need to understand the principles on which this country was built. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that if we understand our Constitution, you know, I say, Jesse, to people all the time, if we would just follow our Constitution and the Bible, we wouldn't have as many problems as we have today. That's right. But I of agree. course, people call me a religious fanatic when I say <laughs> that. But, but well, I the, am a, a knee-jerk, right-wing <laughs> religious reactionary. That's where I am. But the, the, one of the, the big problems that we're having is that we're really not following that one document that makes us so very strong. And many of our young people have never heard of the Federalist Papers. When you talk about the principles on which this country was founded, the first thing they say is, but we were enslaved. Well, I say to young people all the time, slavery was a business deal. Yeah. It, that's what it was. It was a business deal in which the white man bought us, the black man sold us. If people just look at it and let it go at that, there is slavery going on in this country, uh, uh, I mean countries all over the world today. Right now. Uh, so America at least addressed the problem. America went to war to keep this as one nation. And what I see today are people like Jackson and Farrakhan and Murky Waters and all the rest of them, they are dividing this country. And the, the thing that I, the only thing I can attribute to them doing this would be the power, the greed. Yeah. Uh, I can't see any other reason for it. Uh, so the, the idea of, of, of giving certain states over to Farrakhan for a black state, well, you know, we should look at what happened. Uh, um, free slaves went to Liberia in Africa, and, and that was their state. They went back to Africa to yeah. make it okay to be back on the homeland. We are now, even our own United States troops have evacuated. Everybody's evacuating now. <laughs> Even today, we're having um, yeah. um, aid workers and so forth having to leave because of the fighting. When you look at the countries on the African continent that, that are fighting, and I'll tell you something else that bothers me. A lot of people get upset with me that I criticize the name African American. Now, what bothers me about that is that Africa is a continent with many countries. And we have our children pledging allegiance to an entire continent. <laughs> the, each, each country has its own culture. And we even have some groups that's made up a culture. Like, like Kwanzaa, they made it up and call it an African culture. Yeah. Are we so desperate for a culture? We have our American culture. And we, culture is your own traditions, where you grew up, what you, what you experience, what is uh, traditional with you. You know, we used to have what's called soul food. Black History Month now is African cuisine. Oh, we don't have soul, soul food, food anymore. anymore. Oh, my goodness. We used to call it soul <laughs> dancing. You know, we used yeah. to be uh, soul dancing. Well, now, Black History Month, what do you see? Mostly African drums. That's amazing. And, and so the thing is that we are trying to incorporate a heritage that most of us know nothing about. I mean, unless you are a politician or financially capable, most of the 30 million blacks in this country have never set foot on the African, not one country in the African continent. Wouldn't even know it if so it's how would we face. know what that tradition is? Yeah. Um, and, and another thing I noticed about that too, people like the, poli the black politicians, they are, they are complaining about America. America, and they are keeping us, uh, many blacks, angry about it. But yeah, these people are getting wealth. They're doing very well financially. Their children are doing well. <laughs> you know, they, I mean, they're living in big homes and complaining Gated about communities, it. communities, yes. But yet, the rest of black America won't even stand back and look at that. Now, they don't even think, well, if, white, if the white man is holding me back, how is it that these people are getting so educated? Mm -hmm. How are they getting so wealthy? Why can't they look at that? Why don't they kind of just pull back and look at just that little simple thing? Well, when you look at all of the publications that come into our community, Ebony and Jet, Sentinel, all of, all of them, they all give the same message. Yeah. How many conservatives do you hear on the airwaves in the black community? I haven't heard one. That's right. And how many conservatives are written about in black papers? I, you don't no, see it. That's right. 
you know, and you, you may read of people like Walt Williams and Thomas Sowell or uh, the Richardsons and, and, and uh, you know, even with us, we're published all across the country. Yeah. But do you think that our local uh, I think media about would that have too. us? That's right. And, and that's because they don't want the community to hear the opposing viewpoint, and to have dialogue right. with us. That's a shame. Mm -hmm. We need to take a break. And when I come back, I want to talk about your organization. And I want to know how did you, what had kept you going this long? And what are you hoping for? All right. <laughs> okay. We're going to take a break and be back in a moment. Bond, the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. Rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. For more information, call us toll-free, 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-BOND. I'm talking to Isola Forster today. She's from Americans for Family Values. She also has a book that uh, she did on what's right for all Americans. And she has a, her organization is nonprofit. If you'd like to know more about her organization, her newsletter, anything about her, feel free to call her at 310-823-5871. Three one zero eight two three five eight seven one. Right. All right. And it's uh, Americans. What's right for Amer all Americans? All right? Americans. All right. right. Good. good. Uh, Isola, let's talk quickly about uh, what it's like to be a black conservative. Uh, I know for me, uh, the last seven years I've become what they call a black conservative, and I am a Republican. And it has been, uh, I've gone, I have endured more than I've ever had to endure in my whole life. Uh, my telephone's tapped, uh, call her Uncle Tom, nigga, sell out, um, uh, because I live right and I work hard and I think with a clear mind, I think like white people, <laughs> uh, just all kind of stuff. And this is only the past seven years. You've been doing this for what seemed like a lifetime. How have you been doing that? Tell us about your house getting burned or blown up and <laughs> watched. Did you know her house got blown? She almost, they burned her house down? Well, actually, that was a blessing because that moved me to the other side of town. It was very <laughs> nice out there. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I think it all started um, when I went into the Watts community in 1960. Well, I moved into South Central in 61. And I started working at Jordan High School in uh, the Watts community in 63. And... Uh, it was so dismal. There were no programs that really, uh, the, the students just seemed so, so dead. They, they were like hungry for something to fulfill their curriculum and, and to help them not only to learn but to build them character-wise. So I instituted a lot of programs. There were a lot of uh, fights in the community, so I started bringing in the Sheriff's Department. Now, this was before government funds were used to pay for these programs to come in. And I became very much involved with the students. So then after the, uh, the rise of 65, I started noticing all of the money coming in to the community. Right. And especially because Jordan was used as a blueprint for special funds for schools all across the nation. And I was aware of the programs there. And as I saw the money coming in and I began to notice the abuse and and it was almost like a deliberate attempt not to educate our children. Yeah. And I began to notice this and then I began to, as I said, file complaints and one thing led to another and um, I went to all of the elected Democrat officials. I knew them. I worked for them. I got a plaque working for <laughs> Tom Bradley to put him <laughs> in office. So, you know, I went to all of them. And then I realized they know the problem. I'm talking to them like they really don't know what's going on, but they all knew. Religious leaders, all of them. Yeah. Now, again, Jordan High School is rich in history because it is Jordan High School that started busing in Los Angeles really? with the 1963 Crawford case. And so it just went on and on and on from there. And then uh, in the late 70s, where they instituted this, this um, illegal attendance policy, I had just got my master's in education, so I knew the law, and I knew it was illegal, and I knew they couldn't do it. 
No other school in the district did they do this. And as a result, I began to speak out publicly and I started writing and now I'm writing for a magazine nationally. I'm a columnist now. Um, as a result, I've been called a political commentator because I, by being involved in both parties, yeah. by being a delegate, by um, understanding behind the scenes politicking and so forth. So I've seen a lot and it was a great experience. Um, what keeps me going, how else can you come overcome evil? unless good people speak out. Yeah. You can't. And there's so much fear in our community. Yes. There's so much fear in our community because I, I get calls all the time when people will see me on, on TV or hear me on radio and they'll call me and thank me for saying what they're thinking. Yeah. Well, listen, our community is under siege. When you look, well, I, I understand now that gang banging is supposed to have been curtailed quite a bit, but there is a reason that our community has been studied and reported upon by Newsweek, USA uh, World Report, US News, all of the time have all written upon us, about us rather, as being a war zone, this is Beirut, USA, and so forth. And any time you have the number of people that's been killed in our community and our politicians have been mum, I mean, what people don't understand, look who controls our community. Just look. Yeah. And for the years that the gangsters had our community under siege, you had the most powerful politician in the state of California, the most powerful, some say even more than the governor, Willie Brown. There was not a law that were passed unless he wanted it to be passed. That's power. And then you have Maxine Waters, who was over that district. You have Diane Watson, who's over the district. You have Mayor Bradley, who was the mayor all of those years over the district. You had Gilbert Lindsay, who was called the emperor. He had so much power and had been on for so long. So you look at all of these powerful politicians over this one area, and it's the worst area in the state. Yeah. Now, I mean, people should <laughs> think about that. What's the point? I fought in the civil rights movement to give political power to blacks, thinking that's going to help us. And I'm looking at all these powerful blacks in a community where I am, yeah. and we can't even keep clean streets. You can't even get the streets clean. You know, because of time, uh, your impression of the black ministers, I, for the most part, think that, all, that they're all wicked, and that I'm sure maybe there's one or two somewhere. I haven't seen them but there's always an exception to the rule. But I think that they are wicked and they are taking advantage of the community as well. What is your opinion of the black ministers? You know, when I first learned that uh, the LA Unified School District was gonna have coming out day for teachers and on all of these other issues, we got in touch with the most prominent ministers in this city, the most prominent and they all refuse to take a stand on this issue. And I think that the code of silence among our clergy and by them just allowing uh, Jesse Jackson to speak for all Christians is just, um, I think it's tragic. Yeah. I think it's real tragic for, for our community. Um, the only way that you had Farrakhan getting so many uh, men out to his march was because our Christian ministers allowed them on, in their pulpit to lure these innocent, decent yeah. young men there. And so, uh, you know, how can a, a Christian minister who, who is going to preach the Bible based on Jesus Christ support Farrakhan who doesn't believe anything about Jesus Christ, could care less about a Jesus <laughs> Christ. Teaches hatred what? as well. And well, of course he yeah. teaches hatred, but what I'm saying, you're talking about religious leaders yeah. who are allowing their pulpits to be used for political reasons. Let me ask this. Um, what is your impression? Uh, we know that the family is broken down. It's like nearly destroyed. What is your impression of black men? I mean, for the most, not all, but many that are kind of weak and out there and can't seem to get it together. Why do you think that is? But I, I mean, I, why do you think that is? Well, as I said earlier, my background is strong men right. in my life. From my grandfather, my father, my brothers, stepfather. That's right. uh, I've always been very fortunate to have strong men in my life. Uh, but I tell you what I saw happen, and and because I saw it as it 
became, you see, the Crips and Bloods got their start in Watts. Mm. And the one and the uh, the two housing projects, and and I can go into that history a little bit at another time. Yeah. But what happened was they began to gain up on this father who might want to protect his daughter, or this father who might not want this kind of element in his home, and they and and, and there was no one to stand up with the man. Yeah. Because you have your politicians standing up with the gangsters, you have your ministers not saying very much except that we should coddle them and remember that they're somebody's son. Well, look, those little innocent children that they're shooting in their living rooms are some they're somebody's yeah. daughters and sons too. And so what it is, and they've been glorified so. So the yeah. average man, it, it, I, gee, no, it's, it's so chance. hard. He 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 has to stand alone. Uh, one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting my signature over there. Isola, what, what can they do? What can black Americans do to get out of this real quickly? I mean, is it just a simple matter of waking up and seeing what's happening and walking away from it? Or what can they do? I think uh, that they are. They are waking up. And you could look at the way that they're voting on, on, on issues. Yeah. And I'm just hoping that, uh, Jesse, the more that uh, people like you can get out there, get the voice heard, and have the people to start thinking. Yes. Not thinking with the color of your skin, but thinking about what's right for you and what's right for your country and what's right for your family. What's your phone number again, Edola? 310-823-5871. He's Ola Fortes, the founder of uh, uh, Americans for Family Values and her organization is open to everybody in this country and in the world, so don't just feel you have to be black. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me on, and, Jesse. Uh, we're gonna have Pleasure. to do some more stuff. We gotta continue to fight. Keep up the fight, all right? Thank you so much. It so much. Thank you. All right, goodbye. Thank you, sir. Bye.